If you're new here today at Restoration, or maybe you're watching online for the very first time, we're kind of going through our uh, the series in the Gospel of Mark. And so if you have your Bibles today, uh, which I hope you do, uh, we'll be in Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. We're going to be looking at verses 45 through 52. Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 52 in the Gospel of Mark. Uh, let, me, let me read it here. It says this. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. Well, he dismissed the crowd, and after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them, And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded. For they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. Thank you for our moms. Thank you for our mothers. Thank you for blessing us with them. We're so blessed to have them, their care, their comfort, even their discipline. We're just beyond blessed. May we honor them today. And God, I pray that you would work in our hearts today for the next few minutes as we open up your word. I I believe that today you have a word for someone, that you want to speak directly into someone's heart, into someone's life, into someone's situation. And so, God, we lift up your word as inerrant, infallible, the authoritative word upon our lives as believers. We thank you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, church, last week we talked about Jesus feeding the 5,000. Jesus fed the 5,000, and really it was more like 15 to 20,000 people that he fed. Uh, After Jesus fed the 15 to 20,000 people, we're going to see in our text today that, that Jesus gets in the boat with his disciples once more and heads over across to the other side. Uh, And and I just really believe that today we're going to really see uh, really who Jesus is. We're going to see who Jesus is and really what that means to our life as Jesus walks on water in today's text. In 1906, there was a man by Albert Schweitzer, Albert Schweitzer, in 1906, who published a book called The Quest of the Historical Jesus. The Quest of the Historical Jesus. And really his thesis uh, that he wanted to get across was really just a bunch of different theories about Jesus walking on water or Jesus doing supernatural things. Essentially, he wanted to prove that all of these supernatural things and supernatural miracles that Jesus has done or that the Bible talks about, he wanted to disprove them through a scientific approach. Uh, It's more specifically when he talks about Jesus walking on water, he calls it an optical illusion that somehow, some way, Jesus made himself walk on water as like an illusion. Uh, maybe years ago, do you guys remember that Chris Angel guy uh, who walked on water, but really there was plexiglass in the pool? You remember that? Uh, but it was kind of a, an illusion, like something like that. And that's what Albert Schweitzer said that Jesus kind of tricked people. Uh, he also said that maybe Jesus was walking along the shore or a sandbar that went deep into the sea, and really, he wasn't really walking on water. In 2006, a scientist said that um, in the two days during uh, the time where Jesus lived, when Jesus lived, uh, the temperature in that area dropped about 25 to about 25 degrees, and so what would happen is you would have ice on the lake, and so really what Jesus did, because Most likely that's what happened. It was freezing, the lake froze over, and Jesus was floating on a patch of solid ice. And so it looked like he was really walking on water 
when he wasn't. And so really, just what these guys have been trying to do for years and years now is try to discredit Jesus walking on water. Uh, they believed that Jesus was a man, that he wasn't God. And so they were trying to disprove that Jesus, this man, cannot walk on water. That it was impossible for a human being to walk on water. And that's completely true. A human being cannot walk on water. But Jesus is not a human being. Jesus is God. Jesus is actually the God-man. He's not 50% human and he's not 50% God. He's 100% human and he's also 100% divine. And that is why Jesus can walk on water. They're completely right. A man can't walk on water. A mere man can't walk on water, but a God-man can. And so really what we're going to see in our text today, church, is Jesus' divinity. Jesus basically yelling out, saying, hey, I'm God. And at the very end of the message, here's what I want to do. I just want to dive deep into this passage. And at the very end, just, just ask the question, what does this mean to us? Like, what does this mean to us? How do we then apply this passage to our lives? But I'm so excited. I, I really believe, because here's the thing. If you've been around church for a long time, you know, you kind of see these passages, you've heard them over and over and over again, and you're like already thinking, I already know how he's going to preach that. I know what he's going to say. No, you don't. No, you don't. You think you do, but you don't, okay? You, you think you do, but you don't. So let's just dive in. Get your Bibles, whether physical Bible or your phone. Let's dive in. Verse 45 says this. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat, and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. Now, why? Why did Jesus make his disciples get into the boat? There's really a lot of reasons. The first reason is the Gospel of John tells us that the crowd, after feeding like all of these people, they wanted to make him king. They wanted to make him king. They wanted uh, Jesus to become this political leader or a political savior. And Jesus isn't a political leader. He's not a political savior. He's a spiritual savior. And so Jesus said, hey, I'm not a political king, so we just kind of need to leave. Also, the second reason why Jesus made his disciples get into the boat was because his disciples were probably trying to capitalize on the success of Jesus's ministry. I mean, Ministry's booming. Like, like man, he, they, his ministry exploded. There's, you know, in, in about a year and a half, there's 15 to 20,000 people coming to listen to Jesus. And so think about it. Jesus fed these people, all of these people, and the disciples are like, Jesus, we have to stay. Like, like our ministry's booming. Like, let's make this thing bigger. Like, let's go. And Jesus says, hey, hey it's not about that. It's not, all, it's not about capitalizing on momentum. Why? Because the third reason Jesus led, uh, Jesus made his people, made the disciples get into the boat. Because he had another lesson for the disciples. I've been saying for the last three weeks that Jesus is in what type of business? The faith development business. And so he made his disciples get into the boat because he was going to lead them into another storm. He's already done that once, you remember, about a month ago. He's about to do it again. Now, in this passage, as we see that Jesus made his disciples go, I think there's this underlying idea that Mark is trying to get across here. And, that is, and the idea is this, that Jesus, by making his disciples get on this boat, by leading his disciples into another storm, that Jesus is displaying his divine sovereignty that Jesus is displaying his divine sovereignty. Now, what does that mean? It means that Jesus, his sovereignty, is in control of every single thing in our lives. That whatever Jesus planned before the beginning of time, he will accomplish his plan and his purposes in our life. It means that Jesus has all authority over his creation, including us and including his disciples. So we see here, underlying 
in, in Mark's, Mark's gospel, Jesus' sovereignty, that he is in control, that he is moving the story according to his plan and his purpose, just like he does our lives. Notice this in verse 46. It says that after he had taken leave of them, after he dismissed the crowd, he went up on the mountain to pray. Let me just, let me just pause that for a second. Isn't it interesting that Jesus prays? You think that's interesting? Isn't it interesting that the Savior of the world, God himself, prays? Now, what does he pray about? Have you ever wondered that? Like, what would Jesus pray about if he had to pray for something? I think he would pray for a lot of things, but one thing for sure is that he would pray for his disciples. He knew what he just led his disciples into. You see, in, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus actually says that he was praying for Peter's faith, that, pre, that Peter's faith may not fail. And so all through the scriptures, we see Jesus praying for us, even now. Romans chapter 8 says that Jesus is currently interceding for us. 1 Timothy chapter 2 says that Jesus is the mediator between us and God. And so Jesus is always praying for his disciples, including you and I. Now, church, just a quick pause here. How much more do we need to be in prayer? How much more do you and I, mere human beings, need to be in prayer? I love this quote by John Piper. He says this. He says, until you believe that life is war, you cannot know what prayer is for. Man, that's good. Until you believe that life is war, you cannot know what prayer is for. Until you understand that this life is a spiritual war and a spiritual battle, you cannot know what prayer is for. And so how much more do we need to pray as, as, as creatures, as human beings, if the Son of God himself prayed? Now let's keep going, 47 and 48. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. So Mark now tells us that it's the evening just kind of keep that in, in your back pocket. Keep that in the back of your brain because we're going to pull that out in just a bit. So it's in the evening. And Mark says that Jesus saw his disciples making headway painfully. Question, how can Jesus see his disciples? Think about that. Jesus is on land. He's by himself praying on his knees. The disciples are out at sea. It's stormy. It's dark. They're far away from him. How did Jesus see the disciples? How? Again, we see, how, we see in this that Jesus is divine. Scholars and theologians call it his divine omniscience. His divine omniscience that he sees and knows everything. Let me give you a, a definition, a, a theological definition about it. Omniscience is the doctrine that Jesus fully knows himself and all things actual and possible in one simple and eternal act. Simply put, Jesus knows everything and Jesus sees everything. Why? Because he is God. And so he sees somehow in his omniscience that his disciples are out at sea struggling. Mark says he making headway painfully. The word head headway in the original language means to urge or to propel along or to row. So they were rowing painfully. They were struggling. Now what's really interesting is that the word painfully in the original language means to torture to torment or to harass. So the winds, the storms were crashing upon the boat and these disciples were painfully rowing against the torture of the wind and of the sea and of the waves. 
And all of this time, Jesus is watching. Jesus is seeing. Mark tells us that they were doing this in the fourth watch of the night. In the fourth watch of the night. The fourth watch of the night was 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Did you catch that? We are no longer in the evening. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, between 3 3 in the morning and 6 in the morning. So this is what this passage means. Listen up. This is so good. That for seven or eight hours, Jesus saw his disciples struggling against the wind and the waves for seven or eight hours. It's no longer evening. It's about three, four, five, six in the morning. And this entire time, as Jesus was praying for them, he was seeing them struggle. He was watching them try to make headway, but with no progress at all. So Jesus led them into a storm. Jesus saw them struggle. And Jesus allowed them to struggle. Think about that. Jesus allowed them to to be in the storm. This goes against everything that the prosperity theology teaches. That if you obey God and you do the right things and if you give and serve and go to church, that everything's gonna be okay. That if you give, you're gonna get back. False. They they obeyed Jesus by getting into the boat. Obedience to God also leads you into the storms of life. And it goes against everything that this false gospel teaches because Jesus allowed them to go into the storm. He actually led them into the storm. Yes, Jesus saw their suffering. Yes, Jesus allowed them to suffer. But Jesus didn't leave them in They're suffering. He didn't leave them there. Jesus goes to them. In the darkest hour of the night, he goes to them. Jesus, in their darkest moment, when they're making no progress at all, Jesus goes to them. And I don't know where you're at right now. I don't know what's going on in your life. But whatever it is, no. Yeah. Jesus has led you even into the darkness of your life. And he sees you, but he won't leave you there. He won't leave you there. He comes to us. He he came to his disciples. You see, the disciples are trying to get to the shore to find rescue. But instead, rescue came to them. And so Jesus, he comes to them. Mark tells us that he was walking on the sea, that he was walking on the sea. This is another display of Jesus's divinity, that the same waters that were crashing over the disciples are now under the feet of Jesus because he is the Lord and creator of nature because he is the sovereign king who controls all things, because he is the one who knows all things. That is who Jesus is. I mean, we're only in a couple of verses in, and we've already seen Jesus' sovereignty. We've already seen Jesus' omniscience, and now we see Jesus being the Lord over nature, walking on water. Now look at verse 48. This is so interesting. This is so interesting. Mark tells us that uh, as Jesus walked towards them, he actually meant to pass by them. Think about that for a second. Just think about that. Jesus led them into the storm, right? Jesus saw that they were in the storm. For seven and eight hours, Jesus watched them struggle And when he was going to them, he actually was going to pass by them and not rescue them. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen that? Like Jesus was actually not intended to go and rescue these guys. That was not his first intention, to rescue them, but to pass by them. Why? 
Why did Jesus intend to pass by them and not rescue them? You see, if you really want to understand the New Testament, you got to understand the Old Testament. You see, this passage is an echo of Exodus 33, when Moses and, and God, the Lord, have an encounter. Exodus 33 says this, Moses said, please show me your glory. But he said, you cannot see my face, for men shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. Check this out. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft, in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. There's a connection there. In other words, Jesus is claiming to be God. Jesus is claiming to be the God of the Old Testament. Jesus wanted to reveal his glory to his disciples, not rescue them. What does glory mean? We use that word all the time, right? Like glory to God, glory. But what does it really mean? What does glory really mean? It's like one of those churchy words we always use, but what does it really mean? It means this. The glory of God is the magnificence, worth, loveliness, and grandeur of his many perfections, which he displays in his creative and redemptive acts in order to make his glory known to those in his presence. Essentially, it's this. We take all of God's attributes together, his entire being, his entire character, and it's something that radiates beauty. The glory of God is God's beauty, and not only is it his beauty, but, it, but it's also God's presence in the lives of his people. That is the glory of God. And so Jesus, because, you know, he's trying to pass by them as, as God passed by Moses, Jesus wanted to reveal himself to the disciples, not rescue them. He wanted them to experience his glory, his beauty, and his presence. But they couldn't. Why? Because they wanted rescue. Because all they wanted was rescue. They were so focused on the rescue, 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 that they missed out on the glory of God. Doesn't that sound familiar to some of you? To me it does. In my own personal life. It's verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost, and they cried out. For they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. So he goes to them, and he says, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Again, Jesus identifies himself to them. And again, this is an echo of another encounter that God had with Moses in the burning bush. Moses asked God, hey, uh, when, when the people ask me, hey, who sent me? What should, I, what should I say, God? What should I tell the people who sent me? And God says, tell them I am sent you. Tell them Yahweh sent you. The personal and divine name for God. Tell them I sent you. What does this I am name mean? What does Yahweh mean? It means that he is, that God is self-existent, that he doesn't need anything or anybody. He's not dependent on anything, but he's self-existent. It means, this name means that God is the creator and sustainer of all of creation. It means that God is immutable. What does immutable mean? It means that God doesn't change. He stays the same. And it means that God is eternal. And so Jesus, essentially what he's doing, he's saying, take heart. Be courageous. It is I. It is I. Your courage, he's telling his disciples, is rooted in my character. So far, what have we seen the character of Jesus to be? 
that he is the sovereign Lord of all of creation, that he's omniscient, that he knows all things, that he's glorious in all of his beauty and all of his attributes, that he's the Lord over nature, that he's self-existent, that he's the creator and sustainer of all of the universe, that he's unchanging and he's eternal. And so he tells his disciples, hey, that's me. That's who I am. Take courage. Take heart. I'm not just anyone. This is who I am. And so Jesus tells his disciples not to fear because he is God. To have courage that comes from God and not their strength. Verse 51. And he got into the boat with them and the wind ceased. And they were utterly astounded for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. So Jesus gets into the boat and the wind automatically stops again. The storm stops. And Mark tells us that the disciples did not understand about the loaves. That same day, the previous day, Jesus fed 20,000 people, and yet they still did not understand who Jesus was. That insane miracle of, of taking just, uh, just some food, very few things, and feeding all of these people, they did not understand. That miracle left absolutely no impression upon their hearts and upon their soul. They still did not know who Jesus was. And sometimes, we're really hard on the disciples, right? Like, how did they not? I mean, Jesus just came through for them big time. Like, how did they not understand that Jesus is with them and he's going to protect them? How many times has God come through for us? Over and over and over and over and over again. And we still doubt him. And we still lack faith. And we still fear. We kind of have sometimes a bad memory. <clears throat> the disciples' hearts were hardened. They did not understand Jesus' true identity. Now, if you have your Bible, and you're looking at the book of Mark, that's where the story ends, verse 52. But what's interesting is that that's, really, that's not really where the story actually ends. You see, the story goes on a little further. Matthew tells us kind of what happens next. You see, Mark only gives us two-thirds of the story. Matthew gives us the whole complete story. Matthew chapter 14, verse 33, it says this. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. That's how it ends. There was a worship service on the water. That somehow they, their, their hearts were hardened when Jesus entered the boat, but somehow it did not end there. It ended in worship. There was a worship service on the boat. It was dark. Jesus was there. 12, and they worshiped him. They worshiped him. They worshiped him for who he is. They worshiped him for what he has done in their lives. I, I love this word worship. This word worship means this in the original language, to express an attitude or gesture. Worship is not just about singing. Worship is our, about our attitude towards God. Worship, uh, it's, it's to express attitude or gesture. One's complete dependence on or submission to a high authority figure. It means to fall down in worship, to prostrate one's, oneself before, to, 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 to look at someone as reverent, to welcomely respect someone. The word worship comes from the Greek word proskuneo. The preposition, the first part of that pros means toward. Proskuneo, the first part of the preposition means toward. The verb kuneo means to kiss. That's what that means, to kiss, 
toward. That's what worship means, to kiss toward. And here's the thing, that, that's really what the disciples did. They were at Jesus' feet, kissing him, worshiping him. There was worship on the water for who he is. So, church, I know we dove deep into the scriptures, but what does it mean to us? Let's bring it home. Let's bring it home. What does it mean to us? If you're taking notes, two things, two things. It's this, that we are to worship Jesus for his works. That we are to worship Jesus for his works. It's, it's what he does. That we are to worship Jesus for what he does and what he has done in our lives. That we are to worship Jesus for leading us into the storms. You're like, why am I going to worship Jesus? Because he has led me into a storm. Like, that's not worship, man. Like, why am I going to worship Jesus for leading me there? Because it's in the storms that our faith in Christ strengthens. That's why we should worship him. That Jesus uses the storms in our lives, those darkest moments to grow our faith. They are simply opportunities for us to grow in Christ. So worship God because he's led you into a storm. There's a reason why you're there. There's a reason why he led you there. Worship Jesus because he prays for you in the storms. He hasn't forgotten about you. He prays for you. As he prayed for Peter that his faith might not fail, he prays for you too. In your darkest moment, when no one's looking, when you're about to give up, he prays for you. And not only does he pray for you, he sees you. He knows what you're going through, just like he saw his disciples. Yes, did he let, let them suffer? Yes, he's going to let you suffer. I'm not going to tell you that following Jesus is easy because it's not. I'm just so tired of preachers saying, man, if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be okay. No, it's not. No, it's not. He led you into the storm. He prays for you into the storm. He sees your every need. But guess what? He's not going to leave you there. He's going to come to you in your darkest hour, in your darkest time, when there's, you're making no progress. You're doing everything in your own strength. Everything. In your earthly power, you're rowing and rowing, and the winds and life is just torturing you. But he's going to come to you, because he's not going to leave you there. And he is worthy of our worship, because he sees this, the storms of our life. So worship him. It's an attitude. Worship him for his works in your life. The disciples worshiped in the darkness. Worship God in your darkness. Worship God in your storm. Second thing, worship Jesus for his worth. The first point was worship Jesus for his works. That's what he does in our life. But even greater, worship Jesus for, for his worth for who he is. In about 10 verses, we saw this explosion of Jesus' deity, of Jesus' divinity, didn't we? That he is the sovereign creator, that he is the Lord of nature, that he is the all-knowing, all-powerful God, that he is beautiful in every way, that he's glorious, that he makes his presence known to his people, his, his people who he's trying to redeem. He's the good shepherd who calls out to his sheep, take heart, it is I. It is I. It is I, the self-existent creator and sustainer of the universe, the unchanging, immutable God that your situation and your storms might change all the time, but guess what? Jesus doesn't change. And his love for you doesn't change either. And his grace for you doesn't change either. And his mercy for you doesn't change either. He is unchanging in all of his ways. He is eternal. He's always been. There's nothing new for him ever. That is the God who we worship, the I am. 
And so church, here's the big idea for today. Worship is our response to Christ's work and worth. I mean, that is it. Worship is our response to the work of Christ and the worth of Christ in our lives. To worship him in attitude, in action, with gratitude. Worship is a posture of the heart, not just the lips. Matthew chapter 15, verse 8 says, These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are are far from me. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Jesus doesn't want lip service. He wants heart surrender. Jesus doesn't want lip service. He wants heart sacrifice. Stop talking about being a Christian. I'm so done with that. Just stop talking about it. Be it. Do it. Obey him. Worship is obedience. Worship is honoring God. Yes, worship, part of worship is singing praises unto him, which he is worthy And he deserves our worship with our lips. No excuses. I've seen some people at at rock concerts, at secular concerts, but for whatever reason, when we come to church, stone cold. It's just not my thing. But dude, you were just at a rock concert the other day singing your guts out. He wants worship, man. Practical thing, practical thing. Two questions to ask yourself this week, every single day. What has God done or is doing in my life that I can praise him for? What has God done or is doing in my life that I can praise him for? Number two, what is one attribute of God that I can praise him for? Every single day, in your quiet time, as you're talking to God, what is one thing that I can praise him for? What is one attribute that I can praise him for? Worship him. May your heart bow before the Lord. May your heart surrender before the Lord. And if you don't know Jesus, man, I encourage you to surrender your heart today. To bow your heart today. This side of eternity. Because guess what? One day, Scripture said that every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This side of eternity. Today matters. Today matters. Are you right with God? Are you sure you're right with God? There's too many people walking around thinking that because they come to church and because they're in church, they're in Christ. But it's not true. I know you weren't expecting that Mother's Day message. Man, the word of God is powerful. And he's with you. In your darkest times. He sees you. He cares about you. He loves you. The sovereign creator loves you. Let's pray. God, we thank you. And we praise you for all of the works that you've done in our lives. We give you praise, we give you honor, not just with our lips today, but God, we posture our hearts before you for providing for us when we had no provision, for giving us strength when we were weak, for giving us peace in our anxiety, for giving us hope when we had no hope at all, for restoring our joy when the storms have just killed the happiness and joy in our life. God, we thank you for your works. Jesus, we thank you for dying on the cross, paying the price for our sins. Jesus, we thank you that that you lived the life that we couldn't live and you died the death we should have died. Jesus, we thank you for bearing the wrath of the Father on the cross that was intended for us. 
you took it upon your shoulders, all of our sin, to forgive us, to give us hope, to give us life, to give us freedom in you. God, we thank you for your worth because you are glorious in every way. You are beautiful. We can't even truly comprehend that. You are magnificent. You are unchanging. You are gracious and loving and merciful. You are all powerful and all knowing. You're the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And God, we praise you today. We thank you for who you are. We thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for your sovereignty that nothing in our lives by accident, you control everything. You lead us into the storm and you take us out. God, we give you all the praise and we thank you. In your name we pray, amen and amen.